Because we are talking about solutions. And next thing we're talking about is solution in water. This means dissolving. And you have all experienced it. You have all done it firsthand in the lab, as you know, is the kitchen. So you may have put some sugar in water, some salt in water. You may have dissolved Gatorade, powder. So whenever you're dissolving some kind of an ionic species, like you've got positives and negatives in there, the individual ions will separate and they get surrounded by water molecules. So here's a chloride from sodium chloride, and you see this ring of water around it. The water actually acts more like a sphere. It completely envelops it. So chloride is essentially stuck inside of this ball of water. So for me, it reminds me of that Harry Potter movie where he really wants to fight, but Dumbledore puts a ball of water around him, and he cannot fight. So chloride is still extremely attracted to sodium but it cannot find its love sodium, and it cannot find it because water is all around in a three-dimensional sphere. And water has these partial charges, so it has partial positives. I mean, it's nothing like the true love of a sodium, but because there are so many and they are completely surrounding the chloride, it separates the chloride from its partner, sodium. So questions on anything there so far? <clears throat> All right, so dissolution is another word for dissolving. And we also call it solvation. So not quite like the salvation of coming to chemistry class, but solvation, <laughs> being surrounded by a solvent molecule. And here water is our solvent. So here it says when the ion is solvated, it is effectively isolated from the other ions. So ions, positives and negatives, they are very attracted to each other. However, when water gets in the way, they cannot find each other. They are, would get back together if they could. So later on, you're going to learn that every once in a while, some of these waters just move for a moment. And the moment they move, if there's a positively charged ion, they see their true love across the beaker. And they do actually try to get back together. But the water stops them. So it is completely isolating this chloride. So in terms of the chloride right now, it does not feel the charge of the sodium. That's why it's not getting back together. It's still attracted to the sodium, but it cannot feel it. It cannot see it. It is being isolated by this ball of water. So just remember a little Harry trying to fight, but he is surrounded by that water. So Harry Potter is solvated. So next time you're watching that with a little kid, they're like, oh my gosh, Harry. And you're like, Harry has been solvated. <laughs> you like this is your first chemistry lesson. Harry Potter has been solvated. All right. So, questions on anything here? All right. So that brings us to electrolytes. So electrolytes are substances that can disassociate into ions when they dissolve. So this means it's an ionic compound that breaks apart. Those create those ions that are charged, and those charged ions can transmit electricity, and that's why we call them electrolytes. So a common mistake is that everything that dissolves is an electrolyte. That's not true. It must break up into charged species, which means it must be an ionic compound. So we've got lots of stuff that dissolves. You all know sugar dissolves. We all have lots of wonderful sugary drinks um, that dissolve. But sugar does not break up into ions because it's not an ionic compound. Can you all recognize this as an organic compound with that carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen? So our ionic compounds, like I'm sorry, our organic compounds like sugar do not break up into ions. Because of that, they are called non-electrolytes. They do dissolve, just not into charged ions. So the only way we can carry electricity is with these charges. Therefore, the only things we can call an electrolyte are going to be our ionic compounds that dissolve into ions. So, what do electrolytes do? Like, make your body dense? You know, has after workouts and stuff? Ah, so good. very good point. So, um, let's see, Trace. I'm going to jump ahead. I am going to pull up a PowerPoint that we're not going to see for a little bit, but that's okay. So the 
this is kind of a preview of what we're going to see in our last chapter. We're going to talk about solutions again. So this is before your workout. So you have the correct number of electrolytes. So the solution on the outside of your cells and on the inside has have essentially the same layer. So this is what we want. However, during your workout, what can happen? You're replacing with pure water, but you're sweating out all your salts. Right. This solution on the outside becomes, oops, let me scroll down just a moment, what we call hypotonic. Right. So without adding any more electrolytes, this is too dilute, and what's going to happen is the solvent in the water flows inward, and it's sometimes it's something we sometimes call, wa call water intoxication. Oh, okay. Yeah, got it. Just some fun stuff. Later on, when we get to that. I have some videos shot under a microscope, so you can actually see what happens to red blood cells when they start getting really large and then burst, and, and some that get into very concentrated solution. And we say they crenate, they shrivel up. But everybody looks happy and healthy here, so it is my strong belief that your red blood cells look like this right now. So, so when you drink like a Gatorade, it just keeps it together. Uh, yes. What it's doing is it's adding on that solute here so that we keep what we call an isotonic solution so they have the same molarity. Yes. But if you don't work out, then what is that doing? Your body should be able to flush out the extra electrolytes. Yes. Yes. So your body should be able to flush things out and readjust. The problem is if you're working out, you're out in the sun and you're really losing a lot quickly, and then you're replacing quickly with water. But your body does have a mechanism that if you've ever been out hiking and you're really thirsty, but you try to drink some water and it makes you feel nauseous or maybe even vomited up, even though you're thirsty, that's your body being like, hey, I need some electrolytes. The problems that we've seen is where there's like radio contests where they're like, hey, drink all this water, you're gonna get a free t-shirt. And people, they feel sick, but they're like, I'm gonna keep drinking because I want that t-shirt. That's where we have a lot of problems. Okay. But other questions with the electrolytes? Yes. So, like, in that, for both equations, I guess, like the top one, NaCl, and there's the H2O above the arrow. Is oh, the yes. same as saying plus H2O? It is. It's the same as saying plus H2O. It's just if I said plus H2O on the left, I have to do it again on the right. So, it's saying the water's not really used up. It is just there, in this case, as a solvent to dissolve everything. So, later on, you're going to see if we have, say, a catalyst, something to speed up the reaction. Or if we just want to talk about the solvent, but it's not really involved here, we just put it over the arrow. The other way, yeah, it'd be weird because we have to put it on the left and on the right. All right. So other questions so far? I'm so sad. It's like the last time I get to see you in person for a while. All right. All right. So the reason we do call them electrolytes is because they can conduct electricity when they're dissolved in water. So the more particles in solution, the better they can conduct electricity. So this is an experiment where we have a light bulb, we have a battery, or some kind of power source, but you notice the wires don't connect. So instead, we have them here in pure water. Now, pure water is just H2O. It's not an ionic compound. It doesn't ionize. So because of that, we don't get any light from the light bulb here. However, if we did have some charged particles, we would be able to light up that light bulb. But let's talk about these substances first of all. We started to talk about sugar before. So do you think sugar is an electrolyte? No. no. So I'm going to put electrolyte with a question mark. And we decided sugar was not one. So distilled water is pure H2O. So pure H2O, do you think that is an electrolyte? No. no. <clears throat> How about tap water? Yes. yes, tap water has lots of ions in it. Once upon a time when we were talking about homogeneous and heterogeneous solutions, we talked about distilled water. So distilled water is the water that we have on the side taps. I recently got a humidifier, and it requires distilled water. I don't know if you know this, but those are hot items at all the stores right now. So everybody's getting humidifiers. Uh, hard to get. But distilled water, we have taken out all the ions. 
but tap water has ions that make the water taste good to most of us. We don't realize they're in there, but there's things like sodium and magnesium, definitely fluoride in our water. Um, so it definitely has ions in that. What about salt water? Yes. yes, it has the NaCl in there. So questions on anything there? So does that mean that substances with electrolytes are more conductive? Oh yes, so they are the only ones that will conduct. So if you just had uh, distilled water, even if you threw sugar in there, it wouldn't conduct at all. Yeah. So distilled water should not conduct if they distilled it properly. Right. So other questions on anything here? So interesting fact, you probably know we have a lot of salt water in our bodies, and of course we have sweaty hands. Some of us more sweaty than others, it's all good. Um, back when I was a student, we still did this experiment, and for some reason back then I was really obsessed with cleaning, I'm not so much anymore, but every time I would take it out of one solution, I needed to clean it. So I would spray it down with my distilled water, and then I felt like I needed to dry it off, and so I had the paper towel, but I also had my hands, and I would dry it, and I would get quite a shock because it would, my hand had enough electrolytes on it to conduct the electricity. And so I would shock myself and be like, oh, man. And then the next experiment, oh, man, I did it again. And I just kept doing it throughout the whole time, and I was like, what is wrong with me? And now I, I'm not obsessed with cleaning anymore. <laughs> I would, it was shock therapy. <laughs> Maybe that would work on someone who's OCD and needs to keep to keep washing their hands. I don't know. All right. So most molecular compounds dissolve impact molecules, not ions. So let me give you an example of that. And one is ammonia, which you have in your Windex. So NH3, which is ammonia. It dissolves as NH3. So we know it as that blue uh, solution that we use to clean windows. The blue is just a coloring. But ammonia itself does dissolve as NH3. It's one big chunk. So it cannot conduct electricity. However, acids and bases, they have the ability to ionize. So here we have an acid. And an acid, by definition, gives off H+. What we're going to see for our basis, something like NaOH, it will dissociate into Na plus and OH minus. So by definition, if you have an acid or base, it is an electrolyte because it can disassociate. Dissociate. Yeah. Yes, so if I were to take, and I'm going to think of it as pure ammonia, so let me move this little guy. I'm going to think of this as pure liquid ammonia, and I'm going to dissolve it in some water. It is going to be NH3, now aqueous, like so, until it does stay together. And that's a common mistake. Most people think, hey, as long as it dissolves, it must ionize, it must conduct electricity. But non it dissolves in one giant chunk. Questions on anything here? So how are we going to take the exam? Um, so, um, so at this point, we are planning to come back sometime in April. So my hope is just to hold off until then. And I'm going to cross my fingers that we can Come back as a group and group hug, no, um, and <laughs> see each other all again in April. And so we'll just postpone the exams until then. Can some of us remain on the online course? What? <laughs> what? What did you say? Can some of us remain on the online course? What do you mean by the online e campus? I mean, I don't know what we're going to do until we get to back over here. I don't know. Well, yeah, we're, gonna, we're still going to meet on uh, that Zoom, and I will be posting the videos on Canvas. Okay. Yeah, so it's not like the class is over. All right. So that would be horribly sad. None of us would stand for that. All right. So next up, I need to know the difference between strong and weak acids and bases. So strong acids and bases, 
they will completely break up into ions. 100% of the molecules will ionize or break up into ions. So here we have our HCl and our NaOH, and they do break up 100%. Every once in a while someone's like, are you sure it's not like 99.9999%? And okay, truthfully, it is 99.9999%. We go with 100. Um, so they do break up. As opposed to the weak ones, weak ones will partially dissociate into ions. Some of the molecules will break up in, uh, in water, but not all of them. And down here, <coughs> the weak one, you see a double arrow, and that double arrow signifies that they break up, they get back together, break up, get back together. So it's a very complicated relationship down there. So I like to think of the strong ones, or HCL, or any waves. They are getting a divorce and they are done with each other. One person's moving to Canada, one to Mexico, don't call, don't text. I never want to see you again. Take me off your Facebook. All right, so they are done with each other. They are not getting back together. This is more like a Taylor Swift song. Yeah, they break up, get back together, break up, get back together. And this kind of drama just goes on in their life all the time. But at any given time, there are some that are broken up, very few, but some that are broken up. And there are a lot that are together but maybe not so happily and so it just goes back and forth back and forth so that's what we mean by weak so we even have the strength to finally end it all right <laughs> so that's the difference between our strong and weak acids and bases so questions on anything there all right so i do want you to know which ones are strong and which ones are weak so we're going to start with our acids. So way back when we did nomenclature, we learned how to identify an acid. So how do you know you're looking at an acid? A hydrogen out in front. Yes, I heard a hydrogen out in front. So in general chemistry, we say that acids have a hydrogen in front. All right, so all of these have that hydrogen out in front. Now there are six strong acids that I need you to memorize, and they are the six on this list. I need you to know these. So HCl, HBr, HI, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and the one that's tough to remember is this one because we don't see it very often. It's perchloric acid. It is actually an acid that can and does explode if it contacts organic chemicals. So it is used a lot in um, geochemistry to dissolve rocks. That's one of the few uses that we have for it. But even in graduate labs, so my graduate lab was a geochemistry lab, so we had this. But we did keep it locked up. Only our professor had the key, and he was the only one allowed to use that. Um, so these are the six, but in practice, most of you will never see, and I never have to use myself, the perchloric acid. Break up stone, rocks. Yes, yes. So perchloric and hydrofluoric can also break through rocks. Yes, can dissolve a rock that's otherwise insoluble. Yes. So you can't, you can't even dissolve it, right? Oh, uh, it'll eat through your hand. You, none of these you would want in your hand. And in fact, most of these can etch glass as well. So sulfuric is known as so a liquid you could use to actually etch glass to mark into the glass. Yeah. So yeah, they, these have to be, especially in their concentrated form, they have to be um, stored very carefully. Um, nitric acid has to be stored separately from the rest. So if you were to go into our stock room, you'd see nitric acid isolated from the others. It can force a reaction in any of those other uh, acids. But is it like, do you need a high percentage of what well, like you could put on a rock? Do you need like. You need the more concentrated form, yes. But you need a lot of volume. No, you don't need a lot of volume. So if you were to drip it on there, it, the rock should start to dissolve. Yeah, not a lot of volume, but you do need the concentrated form. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if you're going to move a mountain, yeah, I, I don't think it would be that helpful to like to like not to like burrow a hole through the mountain. But I have seen when we had a rock with uranium in it, we needed to get the uranium out to analyze it. We used that to dissolve the rock, and we didn't have even. It's a really hard rock, even with like pounding it, we couldn't get it to dissolve into solution. So we used that. Yeah. Interestingly, talking about like burrowing a hole through a mountain in terms of building a tunnel to drive through. 
At one point, we wanted to use liquid oxygen for that, because liquid oxygen, if you didn't know, is very explosive. So if you were to take air and you were to take um, liquid nitrogen, it is actually cold enough to liquefy the oxygen, but you have to be really careful because it's a blue liquid. It is liquid oxygen. It's explosive. They found that it was too explosive, and they were having too many accidents on the way to get it to the mountain. And so they can no longer they no longer really use that. But that was the initial intent when they were starting to liquefy oxygen that we would use it in construction to build those tunnels through the mountain. So yeah. So a lot of our chemicals have really interesting uh, histories. There is a great book called um, I think it's just called The Elements. We'll have to bring in a copy, and it is a picture book of the elements, but also tells you their story. So very cool. All right. So actually, yeah, since we're gonna. One more little aside, since we, you guys aren't going to be coming to class, you're going to have a little more time. There's another great book. I know they have it at the Los Angeles County Library. You can always request it to be delivered to your local library. It's called The Radioactive Boy Scout, and it's about a little boy who's earning his Boy Scout badge. True story. And his dad worked for the energy company, and he's like, don't worry, Dad. I know it's hard times right now, but I'm going to help you. I'm going to build a nuclear reactor. And they really did have a radioactive uh, badge, and at that time, before the internet, he would write to college professors. He's like, hey, I'm, a, you know, I'm eight years old, and I was just interested, just for the heck of it. And then he found out that smoke detectors have a little piece of radioactive material. He had ordered a few hundred, you know, I know he thinks this of a little boy, but he did. Um, and he started building his nuclear reactor. He did a very good job of it, and the EPA finally found out because the whole area became radioactive. Um, and it became a super fun site, so if you didn't know the EPA, when they find a major contamination area, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars cleaning it up. That became his backyard. And so it's an interesting little story of his adventures. That, it's called The Radioactive Boy Scout. It's a nice, fun book. All right, so back to our chemistry. So these acids I need you to memorize, and all other acids are weak. There is one commonly mistaken one, and that is hydrofluoric acid. And that is definitely a weak one. The reason people mix up hydrofluoric is because you have three halogens up here, chloride, bromide, and iodide. And it's really easy to think, oh, all the halogens form strong acids. But we do have one that is weak. It's still a very dangerous acid, but it's officially classified as weak because it doesn't dissociate completely. So questions on how you're going to know if you're looking at a strong acid or a weak acid? So just for fun, let's say I gave you an acid like so. How would you know if this one was strong or weak? Because it's not on the list, therefore it is weak. Yes, this is weak because it is not on the list. So do you all agree it would be an acid, though, because the H out front? And does it make sense how you're going to determine it's weak? It's essentially just not one of the six that you're going to soon memorize? Yes. Excellent. All right, so questions on anything here with the acids? All right, so next up are weak bases. And I think weak and strong bases are actually a little easier to learn because they're based on the periodic table. So it says group 1A hydroxides and 2A calcium and below. So I'm going to show you on the periodic table. If you happen to have one handy, I would recommend you get it out so you can write this down on your periodic table. strong bases. Right. So our first rule is group 1A hydroxide. So if I zoom in here, this is group 1A. And it applies to everything in group 1A except for hydrogen, because hydrogen plus hydroxide will just be water. So then it will be lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and so on down. So essentially, it will be all of these metals that I am coloring in green. If they are with a hydroxide, they will be a strong base. So any questions about this first rule, the 1A hydroxides? So our second rule is 2A hydroxides. 2A is the column right next door. 
And this one will be calcium and blood. So on the first column, we crossed out the first one. Second column, I'm going to cross out the first two. And everything else here will form a strong base. So for example, calcium hydroxide, strontium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, and radium hydroxide, like so. By the way, how come I only had one of the OHs here on the left, and over here when I did it on the right, I had to have OH2? Balance that two plus charge, excellent. So you want to remember group 1A, not including the first one, and group 2A, not including the first two, with hydroxides will be your strong bases. So only these metals that I've colored in green with hydroxide will be your strong bases. Any other ones will be weak. So the way you're going to identify the bases for now is by the OH at the end. So any questions on anything here? So let me go back over here and say you're going to identify your bases because they will end in OH. So for example, NaOH. In next semester in Chem 1B, you'll learn more ways of identifying them, but for us right now, they'll end in OH. So questions on identifying those bases? So let me give you some examples of, of some of the weak bases. So they could be things like FeOH3, CuOH. Those are both examples of weak bases. So if you were to look at those two, the FeOH or the CuOH, the way you will know they're weak is because their metal is not one of these green ones. In fact, our metal is here in the transition metal area. So our iron is right over here, and our copper is right over here. So when the metal part of your base is here in the transition metals, you're dealing with a weak base. So any questions on anything here? All right, so next up are strong electrolytes. A strong electrolyte is a substance that completely ionizes, just like our strong acids and bases. So they break apart and they do not get back together. The idea is they have more ions, therefore they're better conductors of electricity. So here's a similar experiment with a light bulb. And it's got these two rods here that are going into the water. If there are ions, they can conduct electricity, and we get a bright light from our light bulb. That is when we have lots of ions in solution. And what we assume is anything that can break up completely will carry a strong charge, will allow a light bulb like that to light up. So questions on anything here with our strong electrolytes? So our strong electrolytes are going to include the strong, uh, sorry, strong acids we just learned, strong bases we just learned, and also soluble ionic compounds. And we'll be talking about our soluble ionic compounds and how you'll know if an ionic compound is soluble or not. Good news, and I know we have a well to our next exam now, but I will be giving you a table of the soluble ionic compounds, so you'll be able to look it up on a table. You don't have to memorize which ones dissolve, which ones don't. I just ask that you learn to use the table. <laughs> All right, so questions on anything here? All right, so questions on anything so far? All right, so next up are our weak electrolytes. These are our weak acids and weak bases. We know they have some challenges in life. They are quite sure what they want to do, break up or get back together. Yes? Oh, yeah. Better or you want to down more? More. 
right, what do you guys think? Is this too low? It's too dark. Too dark. Okay, so let's go with this one. This is our usual setting. I forgot to check the last class left it on full lights. So the weak electrolytes, again, those are the ones that partially ionize. They break up, get back together, break up, get back together. Where this double arrow is showing an equilibrium, meaning that they are going back and forth. And here we assume that if they are not breaking up completely, there are not very many ions. And therefore, we consider them to be poor electrical conductors. They can conduct electricity, but not very well. So if we do our light bulb experiment, we see a very weak light in there. Sometimes it flickers a little bit, but that is what we see when we have a weak acid or a weak base, which we're going to consider a poor electrical conductor because there's only a very few ions. So questions on anything here with the weak electrolytes or the difference between a strong and a weak electrolyte? All right, so here's a summary of our three different categories. On the far left is a non-electrolyte. These are molecules. Here I've got pure water, but it could also be something like sugar or ammonia. It's going to be a molecule that dissolves as one chunk. It does not break up into ions. So it's a non-conductor. We would see no light here, so no transmission of electricity. Then we have our weak acids and bases, and they're poor conductors. They conduct a little bit, but not too much. Then we have our strong conductors. So strong conductors will be strong acids, strong bases, or soluble ionic compounds. They are very good conductors. They give us a bright light. And for the same reasons you do not want to stick a wet hand into a light socket, they do a very good job of transmitting electricity. I had to, uh, when I got my cat, I had to cover the light sockets because she thought it might be a good idea to talk about the light sockets. <laughs> All right, so questions on anything here? You, you yeah. said that, I think, in the beginning of the class, uh, in the class okay, there, the electrolytes are along the, uh, the side here, periodically. Um, so our, are you talking about strong electrolytes? Yeah. So our strong electrolytes are going to be these ones for the bases. For the acids, they will be these right here. And then for the ionic compounds, I'll be giving you a table of those. Okay. Right, so other questions? Okay, so let's go ahead and go on break and come back at 6 o'clock. Um, if you did not get your, let's see, lab one or chapter three homework that I had out last class, I have them here for you. All right, so questions about anything else so far? All right, so here it's showing sort of a breakdown of what was going on in each one of these. So here we have no ions. Here we have very few ions. And over here we have many ions. So this is our non-electrolyte. These are weak electrolytes, and there are strong electrolytes. So questions on anything so far with those electrolytes? All right, so just one more review here. Our strong electrolytes are going to be strong acids, strong bases, and soluble salts. The weak electrolytes are going to be the weak acids and your weak bases. All right, so next up I want to talk about concentration of ions. So it says, what are the molar concentrations of each of the ions present in a one molar aqueous solution of NaCl? So let's take a look at what happens with NaCl when it is in water. So it breaks up into one sodium <coughs> and one chloride like so. So if I had... Let's first imagine just one individual little NaCl. So this is going to be my NaCl, it's one little NaCl. When I break up, would you all agree that I have one cap and one pen? Okay. 
So that means if I had one little NaCl, it would break up into one sodium and one chloride. multicolored NACLs. <laughs> All right, so when I have my four NACLs, and I uncap them all, harder to uncap an NACL than it sounds. All right, now would you all agree I have oops, four markers, and eventually I will have four caps? Yeah. All right. All right, so if we had one molar NaCl, I would say that I have one molar sodium, one molar chloride. If I had six molar sodium chloride, what's the molarity of sodium? Six. Six, six yes. And chloride? Yes. All right, so questions on anything there? Recap my NaCl's. So now let's talk about a slightly different compound. Let's imagine calcium chloride. So when we break this up, we get calcium. And what's the charge on calcium? Two. Two, yes. And a chloride like so. And how do I balance that? Two CLs. Yes, two CLs. So based on this formula, Every time this breaks up, we're going to get one calcium and two chlorides. I just happen to have a calcium chloride marker here. All right, so here's my calcium in the middle. And if I have one calcium chloride and it breaks up, I'm going to get two chlorides. So one little calcium chloride breaks up, get one calcium and two chlorides. What if I had two calcium chlorides? How many calcium would there be? Two. And how about chlorides? Four. Four. Excellent. So I could say if I had one molar calcium chloride, I would have one molar calcium and two molar chlorides. Likewise, if I had six molar calcium chloride, what's the molarity of calcium? Six. Six. And chloride? Twelve. Twelve. Excellent. All right, any questions on how we're finding the molarity of our ions? Yeah, how? <laughs> <laughs> any, like, more specific questions? Or just yeah, how? <laughs> so, so, I'm sorry, say it one more time. Is it like Yes, yeah, so the idea is whatever the molarity is here for calcium chloride is a one to one relationship with calcium. So, whatever you have for calcium chloride, exactly the same for calcium. But for calcium chloride, it is twice that. Because it's two, the two in the code. Exactly. So another way that I could... So how does the second row of um, merge of two, two, four? Um, how did we get the two in the fourth? Yeah. So if we had one calcium chloride, we would have two of the chlorides. Because basically what we're doing is we're taking the one that we had originally. Oh, and then there's two calcium. Two yes. So we are multiplying it by this two right over chloride. here. There's two chlorides, and then there's two. So okay. So, okay, that's okay. Let's do. Let's go through it again. Move all this out of our way. All right. So if we have two calcium chlorides, because there's a coefficient of one here, it would still be two over here. So essentially for the calcium, there's a coefficient of 1 here. So it is like 1 times 2 equals 2. Oh, okay. But for the yeah. other one, it's 1. Or, there we go. It is, yeah, 2 times 2. How do you get 6 and 4 and 6? So these ones over here are just ones that I made up. Oh, okay. So what I'm saying is if we start with one, then we'll have one, two. 
If we start with two, then we're going to have two and four. So whatever I choose that we're going to start with, you'll have the same number for calcium because there's that one right there, and you'll have twice as many for chloride because there's a two right there. Does that sort of kind of help? Yeah. Okay. If you want to last minute, we can go over it in more detail. Okay. <laughs> All right, so other questions on this one? All right. So here's a, what are the molar concentrations. And by the way, molar concentration is another way of saying molarity. What are the molar concentrations of each of the ions present in 0 0.025 molar aqueous solution of calcium nitrate? So I want you to write the chemical reaction of calcium nitrate breaking apart into its ions, and then identify the molarity of calcium and the molarity of nitrate, just like we did before. So just to show you an example while you're working. All right, so there's the example up at the top with calcium chloride. You are doing it now with calcium nitrate. Yeah. So you're just breaking it up into its two ions. Remember, polyatomic stick together. All So let's go ahead and give this a try. So how did you write calcium nitrate? C-A-N-O-3. Excellent. So C-A-N-O-3, just like so? Yes, parentheses two, like so, yeah? Oh, All right. So this broke up into calcium, like so, and nitrate, like so. And how did you balance? Two nitrates. All right, so any questions on how we wrote this or balanced this? So I heard a little bit of talk about the polyatomic, and the polyatomic nitrate doesn't break up. Nitrate stays just as it is over here. And when you see that two right over here, it tells you you're going to get two of the nitrates. All right, 
So questions on anything there so far? All right, so we're told that we have 0 0.025 molar of calcium nitrate. So what's the molarity of calcium? 0.025. Yes. 0 0.025 molar. So any questions on how we got the molarity of calcium? How do we get, or I should say, what is the molarity of nitrate? 0.05. So 0 0.050, and so what we're doing is taking our 0 0.025 molar and we're multiplying by 2, and the 2 that we're multiplying by comes from this right over here. So questions on how we found the molarity of the ions? And AJ, I know you had some questions on it before. Does this help a little bit? Mm -hmm. making this up? All right, other questions on this one? All right, so we are moving into chemical reactions. So here is a double replacement reaction. And this is just a generic formula right now. AB plus CD goes on to AD plus CB. What is happening is essentially everybody is swapping partners. We know that we, each one of these is an ionic compound. So we have positive, negative, positive, negative. But for some reason, A had to talk with B and says, look, it's been great, but I need to spread my wings a little bit. And so A goes searching for a new partner, and that new partner will be the only other anion up there, which will be D. So A and D are going to get together, and then C, which is also a cation, is going to get together with B. And so the way I like to remember these is once upon a time, you probably all suffered through algebra. I mean, you all had a fun time in algebra. And you learned the FOIL method. So first, outside, inside, last. So here we are doing our outside. A and B will be brought together. And inside, B and C will be brought together. When we do the inside, though, you will always have to switch the order. The reason you have to switch the order is because when we write an ionic compound, we always write our positives before our negatives. So C will be positive and B will be negative. So that's why when you bring the inner ones together, you will always have to switch that order. All right, so we're going to look at a few different double replacement reactions, and the first one will be a precipitation. It says two salt solutions produce an insoluble salt. So when we say salt solutions, that is a way of saying ionic compounds. So in common speak, when someone's like, mm, this is so good, I love salty french fries, they mean NaCl. In chemistry, when we're like, oh, this is so much fun, we get to work with salt, we mean any ionic compound. So again, in chemistry, any ionic compound is called a salt. So our double replacement involves two ionic compounds, which is to say two salts. And we do call them solutions because this reaction works, I would say, best in aqueous solution. It is possible, but very hard to get them to react as solids. And the specific type that we're talking about here, the precipitation, which is abbreviated PPT, that is a solid. So when we say an insoluble salt, we mean a precipitate or a solid. Now, one terrible thing about that is you turn on the news and they're telling you the weather report, they're like, hey, there's precipitation coming this evening. You're not expecting snow or hail, right? You're expecting rain. You're expecting water. So in the media, when they talk about precipitation, they are talking about water. In chemistry, when we say precipitation, we mean a solid. And in fact, in your test tube, sometimes it actually will look a little bit like it's snowing. You're going to see little particles of solids starting to form. Although sometimes it looks more like this here, which is cloudy. So in lab, when your solution goes from transparent to cloudy or opaque, you just found a solid. So sometimes it's tough to see as a solid. So sometimes you have to sit and wait to really see the solid. But next semester, when you do your qualitative analysis, you're going to get to put this in a centrifuge, and you will see a dark pellet of solid form at the bottom. And then you will say, yes, I just formed a, a red solid in this case. But it starts off just looking cloudy or like a little snowy little particles in there. But as soon as in lab you see anything that is not transparent, you have formed a precipitate, also known as a solid. So again, we're going to look at our precipitation reactions. 
And I do want you to know that a precipitation is when our two solutions are mixed and we form a solid. And for our precipitation reactions, we will always be looking at them as double replacement. It is true in the greater scheme of the world, there's other ways to form solids, but for us, our precipitations will be double replacement. So make sure you know that a precipitation reaction is a reaction that forms a solid. Questions on anything here? Yeah. Um, it's the same uh, thing as double displacement. Right? Yes. So if you learned it as double displacement, it's the same as a double replacement. Yes. So questions on anything here so far? <coughs> All right, so we are going to take a look at this one right here. I'm going to put it on a new page so we have a little more room. All right, so the way I like to do these reactions is I like to take the ions and list them separately. Then I don't have to worry about these subscripts. So let's go ahead and do that. So first of all, we have potassium. What's the charge on potassium? Yes. Then we have our iodide. And what's the charge on iodide? <clears throat> yes, minus one. So any questions on that potassium is a K plus and iodide is the I minus? All right, so next one we have is the lead. What is the charge on this lead? Two plus. Two plus. Two plus. How did you figure out it was a two plus? Yes, yeah. so this two right over here. Any questions on how we got lead as a two plus from this two right over here? So once upon a time in nomenclature, you learned how to cross the charge. I'm essentially crossing it back and bringing it right back over here. All right, then we have our nitrate, and nitrate is NO3 minus. So those are the four ions involved. Right now, we have what we think of as two happy couples, uh, potassium iodide and lead nitrate, but they are going to swap partners. So any questions so far? All right, so now what we're going to do, bring our outer ions together, and we will bring our inner ions, and when we bring the inner ions together, we will change their order. But let's start with the outer ones. When K and NO3 get together, we have to have the positive first. So I'm going to say K, NO3. And are those two balanced? Yes. Yes. So we have a positive and a negative. That one looks good. Next up, I'm going to bring the lead and the iodide together. Is everybody OK with me putting the lead first because it's positive? I'm going to bring those two together. I'm going to call this PB. I like so. And is that a balanced compound? No. Yes, two iodide like so. All right, it's not a balanced equation yet, but any questions so far? Yeah, no? Okay. So a lot of times at this point, students get tripped up because they say, wait a second, there were two nitrates here. Why are there not two nitrates over here? The answer is we don't need two nitrates to balance out the potassium. We will balance them by just balancing the equation. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's balance our equation. So it looks like I have one potassium on both sides. What about the iodides? What should we do about the iodides? Put a two out in front here. And by the way, I'm doing this without writing out the list. Those of you who feel more comfortable writing out those lists, you're welcome to do so. So now I have two potassiums on the left. What should we do on the right? Two in front of the K and O3 like so. All right, so now let's go through again. How's the potassium looking? <coughs> no? Good, okay. All right, so we got two iodides on the left. How do our iodides look? Good. Good. All right, looks so like one lead on the left, one <coughs> lead on the right. Two nitrates on the left and two nitrates on the right. So I balance that kind of quickly, but any questions or anyone want to see me balancing it with the lists? No? Okay. 
So for balancing, it's always your choice. If you can kind of balance in your head like that, you're welcome to. If you want to write out your list, you're welcome to as well. Okay, so any questions on what we've done here? Okay, so I want to again talk about a very common mistake that I see, and the mistake would be this. The reason that we get that is because you have this subscript of 2 right over here. So it's very common to want to bring the 2 to the other side. But that is incorrect because potassium does not need it. All right, so I'm going to tell you a little story. And those of you who don't like my analogy, feel free to cover your ears. But this is to help you remember not to do this. All right, so once upon a time, lead and nitrate, they were going steady. They were getting really serious. And lead was going to be nitrate. Would you like my ring? It's a two-plus charge. I love it. And so everything was good. And then they broke up. And now lead has a new partner. And lead's like, hey, I have never given my ring to anyone before. Would you like my ring? And it's the same ring that it had previously given to nitrate. So that ring really belongs to lead, and if lead goes on to another reaction, lead will give that same ring away again, and it will tell its new partner, hey, it's the first time I've ever given my ring away. But the deal is nitrate doesn't get to keep it, because it really came from lead. And lead is going to take its ring back one way or the other. Lead will not let nitrate keep its ring. So that's just my little analogy to help you remember that nitrate does not get to keep the two, when it's with potassium, because it no longer needs it to balance. All right. So questions on anything there? Okay. So that's just a little story to help you remember. Those of you who are like, that's so silly. I don't need that. I'm a chemistry whiz. Feel free. <laughs> All right. So questions on anything here? All right. So here's actually a picture of how this looks. So our lead iodide happens to be a bright yellow. So again, next semester, if you go on to Chem 1B, you're going to do qualitative analysis where you're going to test for certain ions. And this will be your test for lead. So you will add some Ki to it. And if you get what I like to think of as canary yellow, an explosion of big bird in your test tube, because just one drop and it goes, you get this color right here. It is unmistakable. That is lead iodide, and that tells you that you do indeed have lead in your test tube. So, um, again, this is a solid. It doesn't look like one now. It looks like cloudiness, but if you were to centrifuge this, you'd get a yellow pellet at the bottom. So even though it just looks cloudy, it really is a solid. And then to look right over here at our pictures. What's going on in the beginning is you have your... Ki and your PbNO3, they're separated, and they're both aqueous. So aqueous means they are swimming around in solution, doing backflips, having a great time, but then they get mixed together. After they're mixed together, the lead iodide sits at the bottom because it's a solid, and the potassium nitrate still gets to swim around because it is aqueous. So later on, we will talk about there are certain things that push a reaction to happen. One of those things that push the reaction, or we say drives the reaction, is the formation of a solid. If everything stayed aqueous, there's no reason for this reaction to happen. You have to have a reason for it to happen. For example, let's say it's a beautiful Saturday. You may not decide to come to LBCC and sit in the class. You're like, but there's no reason for me to. My, there's no chemistry today, right? Right, so Monday you might feel that drive, you're like, oh, but my heart yearns to be in T1 1337. But if there's no class, no reason to, you may decide it's not worth the drive over. So there has to be a reason for a reaction to happen. And it's kind of a weird thing, because in lab we always give you reactions that do happen. So there are times when no reaction happens. There needs to be, again, a reason. And a solid, I'll give you a list later of the reasons, but a solid is definitely one of those. A solid pushes or drives a reaction to happen. Just like this fabulous class drove you to come tonight. Little did you know, it'd be the last time we'd be seeing each other for a while. <laughs> I know, it's so sad. All right, for those of you who came in late, we're moving to online classes Monday. All right, questions on anything here about... Um, we go. All right, about uh, precipitation reactions or double displacement, double replacement reactions. 
All right, so I will be giving you um, a copy of this. I was planning to hold on to it until the next class, but I will grab that in my car and give it to you during lab. This is the solubility chart. You will get it today, and you will also get it on your exam the next time uh, we're able to give exams. So here on the left are the ions. So let me zoom in a little so we can take a look. So over here on the left, if I start with that top box here, we have so, uh, lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium. And then we look over to the right, and it says they are always soluble. So good days, always soluble, no exceptions. Here are some of our anions, always soluble, no exceptions. But there will be a few, like chloride, bromide, and iodide. And if I look onto the right side, it says it's insoluble with silver, mercury one, or lead, but it's soluble with any other ion. So some of them do have exceptions, like this one is almost always soluble, except for these here. So a couple things that I want to mention, and that is soluble means aqueous, and it means it will dissolve. And I know that's rough because the word soluble starts with an S, and you want to say soluble means solid, but it actually means aqueous. So if we say something is soluble, it will dissolve into solution, and you will be marking it aqueous. On the other hand, if we say insoluble, oh, actually, I apologize, this is all written down at the bottom. Eh, I'll, I'll write it anyways. So insoluble, that will be your solid. So again, it's tough because you want to say soluble solid, but soluble means aqueous, and soluble will mean solid. I'm going to shrink this down just a little bit there. All right, and that is written out in the sentence form down at the bottom. Soluble, the compound will dissolve into water and make an aqueous solution. Insoluble, it will not dissolve and it will remain as a solid. So on a, a test, when we get to our next test, um, you will get the table here, but you will not get these. So I need you to know what soluble and insoluble are. So these are vocab words I need you to know. So questions on anything so far here? All right, so next up is double replacement for acid and base reactions. So there is a rule here that says an acid base reaction or neutralization reaction. Oops, actually the rule's coming up on the next one. I apologize. Oh, there. Here's your rule. Acid base, acid plus base gives water. However, my recommendation is not to worry about memorizing all these rules. Instead, just treat it as every other double replacement. So you are going to combine the outer and the inner. And with the inner ones, you will be sw swapping the order. You can remember that. You don't have to remember the rule acid plus base gives water. So we're going to go through some acid-base reactions. But any questions on anything here? All right, it says write the equation for the aqueous nitric acid reacting with aqueous calcium hydroxide. So let's do this one together. So nitric acid, going way back to our nomenclature, something goes to ick. What was our rule? Eight. eight. So you ate something, it made you sick. So eight goes to ick. So that means this involves nitrate. So what is the formula for nitric acid? HNO3. Yes, HNO3. Any questions on how we figured out HNO3 from nitric acid? All right, next up we have aqueous calcium hydroxide. So how do we write calcium hydroxide? CaOH2. Yeah, CaOH2. Any questions on how we came up with those formulas? So let's try this one. So we have HNO3, and we're going to add CaOH2. All right, and as I said, we're going to bring the outer ions together. Oops, actually, before we do that, let's 
Just write the ions below. So hydrogen is H plus. Nitrate is NO3 minus. Calcium Ca2 plus. And hydroxide OH minus. So I'm just bringing the ions down. Now we're going to bring the outer ones together, and we will bring the inner ones together. All right, so let's start with the outer ones. What is our first product? H2O. Yes, H2O, also known as HOH. Either one of those is fine with me. So any questions on how we got water there? So can you see why you don't have to memorize the rule that an acid plus base gives you water? as long as you can combine those outer ions. Mm -hmm. All right, so combining the inner ions, what do we get? Excellent, CaNO32. All right, go ahead and take a moment to balance that equation. Um, the only times that I would ask you to do that are going to be what we call the net ionic equations, and on the question, I will have it there in bold that I want that, and any other one, it's your choice. All right, so how are we doing? Anybody want some more time for balancing? Okay, so what uh, coefficients did you add to this? Okay, so I heard two in front of HNO3. Let's put that one in. And then anything else? Two in front of H2O. All right. Any questions on how we balanced or anyone want to see us balance? So questions about anything that we've been doing so far? Okay. So just for fun, let's try another one of these. I know I say for fun. You probably don't think of it that way. All right. So let's see. So you're going to write a balanced reaction between sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide. Let me know if you have any questions and feel free to work with your neighbors. H2O. 
page and so far, but don't forget to cross that out. So still stay for the charge of Eddie, do you remember the charge on sulfate? Sure. Still going to be H2. Yeah, so I always recommend writing your ions right below because that reminds you what to connect to. Are we doing anybody need more time for this one? All right, so let's give this a shot. All right, so how did you write sulfuric acid? Anybody brave? H2SO4. Excellent. H2SO4. 
And what was sodium hydroxide? How did you write that? NaOH. NaOH, excellent. All right, any questions about writing uh, H2SO4 or NaOH? All right, so my recommendation to make your life easier is to write these out as ions. And there were a few people who were unsure about sulfate charge. Make sure you know your charges of the polyatomic ions. And if you forgot, you're in very good company. All right, so you brought your outer ions together and you brought your inner ions together. So when you brought the outer ions together, what did you get? H2O. H2O, yes. So H2O, also known as HOH. Either one works. All right, what was the other product? Yeah, oh, yeah, Jerry? No. You could put the sodium sulfate first, yes. So on that note, if we do it, sodium sulfate like so, is that how we write it? Na2SO4, yes. But you could have put the Na2SO4 before the water if you'd like. Yeah. All right, so any questions on how we wrote our products? All right, so then you balance. So what coefficients did you have? Okay, for two in front of any other numbers? Two H2Os, yes. <laughs> All right, so two NaOH and two waters. So later on in the course, you're going to be learning that two that H2SO4 is called a diprotic acid because it's got two hydrogens and it will always require two bases and it will always produce two waters. So if you identify that your acid's got two hydrogens on it, just to make your balancing easier, you're probably going to need two bases and get two waters. All right, questions on anything so far? How are we feeling about these double replacements? Are these doable? Yes. I won't ask if they're fun. I'd like to think they're fun, but I, I won't ask because I know the answer I'll probably get. All right. <laughs> okay, so I mentioned earlier that not all chemicals react. And that's a weird thing when you're in chemistry. The only ones we talk about are the ones that react. But the truth is they need a reason to react, just like you needed a reason to come to the school today, which is that this is the best class on campus. No. Um, you needed a reason to come here today. They need a reason to react. So here what you're seeing are your three states, solid, liquid, and gas. So, so solid, liquid, and gas, those are your three states. And then a weak acid and a weak base. And my computer is starting to dim because it thinks that it is nighttime, which it is. Let's see, how do I get it? Uh, nope, not that one. All right, I'll figure it out later. That's why the screen looks like it's dimming because my computer is set to uh, dim. Yeah, dim in the evening so you don't get too much blue light. Anyways, so solid, liquid, and gas, those are your three states. Weak acid, weak base. So next semester when you do electrochemistry, you're going to find out that the transfer of an electron can also be a reason for it to occur. But for us, solid, liquid, gas, weak acid, and weak base. So those are your five conditions. You need to produce one of them for the reaction to happen. And the liquid that we normally produce is water. Anytime water can form, that is very favorable. That will drive a reaction to happen. So these are important things that I need you to know. So. I'm going to put a box around these. And then you do another one. All right, so questions on anything here? <coughs> yep. Have you any liquid recipe? It doesn't, have, it doesn't have to be water, it can be any liquid. I just put that there because that's the most common one you're going to see. But yes, any liquid that forms, then this reaction will happen. All right. So now... In the middle of the reaction, there's a difference between the uh, double displacement movement, right? Say that one more time. In the middle of the reaction, for, uh, there's a difference between the... Never mind, that's okay. Are you thinking single displacement versus double? Yeah. So we were going to get to those later on, but just to kind of give you an idea of where all that fun happens. Here we go. So and this is an image from that video I showed you once upon a time. 
So this is where you have one that's by itself, and then two that are part of an ionic compound, and the one that's all by itself, Mr. Zink here, is going to bump out something in the compound. So that's what you're thinking of. Zink is so mean. All right. Okay, so now we're going to get to writing net ionic equations, and a few of you have asked me about states before, solid, liquid, aqueous, um, and whether you have to write them. And what I'm going to say is only when doing net ionic equations, that's the only time I'm going to require you to write your states. And on a test or on a quiz, that will be in bold, and I will tell you, make sure you write your states. Okay, so here is our full equation, and this is 2Ki aqueous plus... PbNO32 aqueous going on to 2KNO3 aqueous plus PbI2. So this one I'm going to call our molecular equation. And the next one we're going to write is the total ionic equation. The total ionic equation is when we break up all of our soluble ionic compounds. So Ki is aqueous. It's an ionic compound, so we're going to break it up. So I'm going to say this involves two potassiums, two iodides, and they are both aqueous. Just to squeeze it all in, I'm going to put the aqueous below. You can put it next to it if you'd like. But that two does apply to both potassium and iodide, so in solution they will break up to two potassium and two iodides like so. So again, we're breaking up our soluble ionic compounds. We'll also break up strong acid, strong bases. So in other words, we're breaking up our strong electrolytes. All right. So next up, we have our lead nitrate. It is a soluble ionic compound, which makes it a strong electrolyte. So I'm going to break this up to Pb2 plus aqueous plus 2 NO3 minus aqueous like so. Let me zoom in there for a moment. So any questions on what I just did, breaking up strong electrolytes, which in this case are soluble ionic compounds? All right, so on the other side, we have two KNO3 aqueous. Again, it's strong electrolyte because it's a soluble ionic compound. So I'm going to say two potassium aqueous plus two nitrates, also aqueous like so. Right. Any questions about how I broke up the potassium nitrate or why I put it two by both potassium and nitrate? Um, yeah. Because the two and the, the coefficient uh, distribute the minus compound? Exactly. Coefficients like the two will distribute to both potassium and nitrate. How about the coefficients at the PB and L3? This little two right here? Yes. So same, this same thing, right? Oh, good job to the front. I mean, we distributed. Well, this two right here is called a subscript, and the small ones do not distribute to all of them, only to the one directly in front. So that's why there's no two in front of lead, only in front of nitrate. Uh, so that is a good distinction. If the two is out in front, it distributes to everything. If the two is smaller, it only goes directly to the one right in front of it. All right, and then we have PBI2. So that is a solid, and the solids do not break up. So again, we're only breaking up strong electrolytes. So soluble ionic compounds, which you will know by the AQ, or strong acids, strong bases. So, oops. PBI2, solids like so. So this right here, this is called our total ionic equation. So the molecular equation on the, on the top, that's the full one that we're used to seeing. The total ionic is underneath where we have broken up all strong electrons. All right, so questions on anything here? Anyone need this screen a little longer? All right. 
So next step, it says an aqueous ion that is present as both a reactant and a product is called a spectator ion. And an ionic equation where the spectator ions are removed are called net ionic equations. So let's give this a shot. When I come back to this slide, let's go ahead and do it first. And I'm going to start with a total ionic. And the first thing I'm going to do is try to find spectator ions. All right, do you see any ions on the left and also on the right? Which ions? Potassium. Potassium. Okay, so I'm going to cross out my potassiums and I'm going to go ahead and put K plus over here. Doesn't matter how many, we're just identifying our spectators. Do we have any other spectators? Nitrate. Nitrate. So we do call them spectators for a reason. So if you've ever been to a sporting event and you're up in the stands and you're a spectator and you're cheering on your team and you think you're really important, right? So the louder you are, the better your team's going to do. And if you weren't there, they would lose because you're, you're the most important part of the team. That's how poor potassium and nitrate feel. They are cheering on lead and iodide. They're like, go lead, go lead, you can do it. And they think they're really important. But the truth is they haven't done anything. They were aqueous ions in the beginning. They were aqueous ions at the end, just like you, like your big accomplishment for the game might have been having a hot dog and a soda, right? Um, maybe they had their hot dog and their soda and they thought they were really important. But the truth is all the action happened between lead and iodide. So what we do here is we remove our spectators, and they're like, hey, what are you talking about? We're important here. All right. And then we write what we call our net ionic equation. Our net ionic equation is everything that's left, every ion that's really doing a job here. And so I'm going to say PB2 plus aqueous comes together with two I minuses, and together they're going to form a solid, PBI2 solid. So that's the real action that happens in a chemical reaction. In fact, these are the only ions that actually did anything. They are our sports team that we're cheering on. The spectators were only there to balance out charges. So a lot of times in chemistry, we prefer to talk about our reaction in terms of our net ionic equation. Because that way we can see exactly what's going on. A lead, two iodides get together to form a solid. When we see the overall equation, it kind of clouds what's really going on. This makes it really clear. And when you get into Chem 1B, a lot of times when you're working on a problem, your teacher will just put up the, the net ionic equation. They're not going to bother with the spectators because you don't need those. This is really what's happening in your chemical reaction. All right, so questions on anything that we did there, how we went from first that molecular equation to the total ionic where you broke up all your strong electrolytes to crossing out your spectators. Yep. You need to separate the lead and the at the end because it's a solid, right? It's a product. Exactly. So let's make a note on what we separate. So only break up. Your strong electrolytes. So this is going to be your strong acids, strong bases, and soluble, I'll put in parentheses, aqueous ionic compounds. All right, and just as a note, I'm going to say do not break up these will be solids, liquids, and by liquid I mean a pure liquid like H2O, gases, weak acids, or weak bases. And 
if you're wondering, wow, how do I remember this? This is the same list that I gave you earlier for the reasons that these reactions happen. So these are the factors that drive a reaction. And actually, the reason they drive a reaction is because they go through a copy of the solution. So that's actually why they can make these reactions happen. So these ones do not break up. You're only breaking up strong acids, strong bases, and soluble ionic compounds. So very good question. All right, so questions on anything here? Are there, are there any times where it does play a factor? Like, um, by it, what do you mean? Uh, when you when they, when they you disregard the, the... The spectators? Yeah. So their only real job is to balance out the charge, so there's no way for us to put in, say, iodide without something to balance the charge. So that's its job, that's the only factor it's going to play here is to balance the charge. So it didn't have to be potassium iodide, it could be sodium iodide, anything to balance that charge. But other than that, no, if it played any role at all, we couldn't call it a spectator. And in, in the real world, too, like if it's if you're not in a lab. But... Um, so in any particular chemical equation, whether that's something going on in your body, if we call it a spectator, we're saying it doesn't play a role. But that's um, in the human body, potassium ion does actually play a role in the sodium potassium pump. So there are certain chemical reactions that potassium could play a role, just in this particular one it does. Yeah. And then it's on the other hand? Yeah. Do we have to keep the charges off the end of the equation? Yes, so everything needs its charge unless it's balanced like the solid. Yes. So unless you have a balanced compound, everything needs its charge, and then here everything needs its state. For the spectator ions, you're just identifying them. Um, so I do want the charge, but you did not have the state there. All right. So other questions so far? All right, so here's that last slide. Just coming back to it. So writing an anionic equation, an aqueous ion that is present as both a product and a reactant. Those are the ones we cross out. We call them spectators. And they're like, hey, what are you talking about? I worked so hard at this game. All right, so they didn't. They were drinking their soda. They were working that hard. And the ionic equation. Uh, in which the spectator ions are removed, that will be your net ionic equation. Okay, so questions on anything here? I know a couple of you want to copy that down, so I'll give you a moment. So questions on anything so far about finding our products or doing this uh, net ionic equation? So my hope was, and this is before all of the uh, online stuff, was to make your next quiz on uh, net ionic equations, but I'm going to have to reevaluate a little bit since we're going online. Uh, but it is a very important topic, and I will tell you with 100% certainty, your exam two, whenever we get to exam two, will contain <laughs> net ionic equations. So if you want to look over the practice, I'm going to do one more slide before we go, so don't pack up yet. But um, if you want to look over the practice quiz two online, it is all about net ionic equations. Okay, anyone still need this slide? Okay. <coughs> so here's sort of an outline for doing net ionic equations, just in case you go back and you're like, oh my gosh, that was so much fun, I just can't remember what we did. Um, so number one, write a balanced molecular equation. That is the equation we've been doing. We call it a chemical equation. Then you need to check to see if the reaction actually occurred. So what are the five things we're looking for? Solid, solid liquid, 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 gas, weak acid, weak base. So your three states, solid, liquid, gas, weak acid, or weak base. You've got to make sure at least one occurs. Otherwise, your answer is this reaction does not happen. No reaction. Then you're going to dissociate all of your aqueous strong electrolytes. So what are the three categories for the strong electrolytes? Strong acids. Strong, strong, strong bases. Yes, soluble ionic compounds. So strong acids, strong bases, and soluble ionic compounds. Cross out anything that remains unchanged from the left side to the right side. Those are your spectators. And then write what is left. That will be your net ionic equation. All right, questions on anything there? I want to let you go because uh, today I don't know if next time I'm going to see you in person. But 
All right, so I'm going to leave it there. Again, on Monday, we will be online. Those of you who can't join us, then um, the video will be uploaded online. Um, the online session, there will be an email link. I will post it on Canvas and email it out to you. Every time we have a class, you will get a new email link, and you can use any web browser, including your phone. Um, there's also a telephone number in case you just want to call in for the audio. Questions about Monday at all? Uh, Oh, so how many times will the online? Same time. Yeah, same time, same day. Yeah. We're moving to online. So it'll be like virtual or it's going to be like. All right, okay. Before everybody gets up, just let's talk, go over it one more time. So it will look. Okay, it's going to look something like this.